Good morning from Faith Baptist Church in Winooski on this Sunday morning, March the 22nd, 2020. Hey, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to continue to provide our messages to our website uh, for those that would like to tune in and watch. Uh, our services will be available from uh, on each Sunday morning by 9.30. I'll have the message uploaded to the website. And then again on Wednesdays, it'll have it up there by 7 p.m. And this will continue through April the 5th. It may be needful to continue beyond that point. We just don't really know at this point. But thank you for faithfulness, your faithfulness in watching during this time. Hopefully you're not watching in your pajamas this morning. I hope you're dressed with your, with your tie on, guys. And uh, who would have ever thought that you'd have the opportunity to come to one of my preaching services in your pajamas until this happens. Amen. But anyway, every once in a while, life brings us something that we're not uh, you know, sort of planning for, if you will. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've never gone through anything like this. I guess probably the closest thing would be 9-11, but uh, even then, after two or three days, my life really didn't change a whole lot. I was in school at that time, and life just pretty much continued on as normal. If you lived in New York City, then that's a different story. But with this crisis, everybody pretty much has been disrupted. You know, no person could have guessed with accuracy what this current coronavirus would have caused to happen in our society. If I'd have told you two months ago that you could not have a roll of toilet paper available to you, you probably would have thought I would have been crazy. But here we're in the midst of this trial and these types of things are already happening. And uh, we don't need to fuss and fight over it. God's in control. He will take care of this. We just need to simply trust him. You know, but unfortunately, we don't get to determine every event of our life that comes our way. Uh, every event and opportunity, we just, you know, we don't control as much as we'd like to think that we do. But there is someone who does, and that's God. Uh, he has the ability to control every event in our life, and he does. And I'm confident this morning, I, I want to look in the Bible and see another man who had a similar situation occur in his life. But really, in honesty, the situation with our Bible example uh, pales in comparison uh, our, our virus uh, and the situation that we're in pales in comparison to what was going to happen in our story this morning. The, the person that I'm speaking of is Noah. Most of you are familiar with him. He's probably been a, a book that you've read to your kids, some little Noah, Noah's Ark story or whatever, but the Bible talks about Noah. It's important why Noah is important to the Bible. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in the end, but this morning I want you to see an event that occurred in the life of a man named Noah. You could say without risk of embellishment, Noah's was a real crisis. And when you compare what we're going through today with what happened with him, I'm not really sure that there's a comparison. Uh, we might think so, but really, in honesty, there's not. At least for Noah and his family, their life was about to change forever in a drastic way. Uh, folks, listen to me. This current crisis pales in comparison to what Noah was about ready to experience. Let's read what's happening uh, in Noah's world when, when the crisis came. First of all, let me tell you, Noah was 500 years old when God brought him the news of the impending crisis. He was married and the father of three boys. In verse 13, Noah gets the details from God of his impending crisis. Uh, he is a man who is, uh, uh, he fears God, he trusts God, he obeys God, and God said to him that he was, uh, that, uh, that he had found grace. But let's just read verse 8, chapter 6, verse 8. Well, well, let's actually, we'll begin in verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Those of us who are Christians know of God's grace. Uh, we have trusted uh, God by faith. We have put our faith and our trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And by God's grace, he has allowed us to be adopted into his family. And we are so thankful. Without God's grace, that would not be possible. Let's read on a little bit. In verse 14, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. 
So this is a massive, massive ship. Uh, to, to translate that into uh, the measurements that we'll understand, basically God told Noah to make this ark 450 feet long. That would mean that if you stepped out the front door of our church, and if that was one end of the ark, the other end of the ark would be all the way down in the parking lot of the Catholic church. That's 450 feet. It's a huge, huge boat. It's 75 feet wide, which probably would be roughly from about this wall in the sanctuary to probably the front of the, of the house over on the other street, or on the, across the street. Uh, uh, it's, it's also uh, 35, or excuse me, 45 feet tall. And to give you a point of reference on this, if you stood in the middle of our sanctuary and you looked all the way up at the ceiling, you would see 28 feet before you got to the peak. So you add another approximately 20 feet to that, and then you've got the size and how tall that this ark was. It was a monstros uh, monstrosity of a boat. Uh, and so, but God said to Noah, I want you to make this for me. What's the point of telling you the dimensions? Well, if it wasn't bad enough that Noah was told in verse number uh, uh, five that God was going to destroy uh, the earth, and he, in verse seven, he says, The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, every creeping thing, uh, and the creeping thing, I should say, and the fowls of the air. God was going to destroy everything except. Noah and his family. And on top of that, he gets that news from God. And God said, then, by the way, I want you to build this huge boat. God told Noah that all of his friends, all of his acquaintances, everyone that he'd ever met, everyone that he'd done business with or traded with or, or fellowshiped with, uh, outside of his immediate family, they were going to be wiped off the face of the earth. What a crisis. Uh, put yourself in Noah's position and think about what that must have been like. Having that kind of a burden dropped on you. That's why I said when we began, this crisis that we're in really kind of pales in comparison. Our greatest problem in this corona crisis is to stay healthy, which most of us do anyway, just by, you know, normal living. And the other crisis we have is whether we're going to get bread at the store. I mean, this is really a silly thing when you think about the crisis of Noah's day compared to the crisis of today. But God goes on and he says to Noah, I'm going to take away all your friends, every animal, every creature, except the ones that I tell you to bring into the ark. He then tells Noah to build this huge ark. By the way, Noah wasn't able to call Home Depot, order all the materials, the ladders, the scaffolding, and all the things that he would need. He had to come up with all of this on his own. Now understand, Noah was a man of God because God was using him mightily to accomplish this. So certainly Noah was operating in the power of God because God never gives us a task that he doesn't give us the ability to accomplish. If he did, he would not be just. Noah would first have to gather all the supplies to build the ark. And, and needless to say, he was in the midst of a crisis. He had just been told everybody he's, he cares about outside of his family is going to be gone. But God says, still, I want you to build this, this ark for your family it's going to be the salvation for your family. So when we come to verse 18, we see the following reassurance from God, where God says, but with thee will I establish my covenant. That's important. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy son's wives with thee. God was telling him to, at some point future, I'm going to tell you to go into the ark. I'm going to shut the door, which signifies that God is in control of who's saved and who's not. And uh, he's going to shut the door, and no one else is going to get in that ark, no matter what they say, no matter what they do. Uh, I can imagine, just in my mind's eye, we don't see this in the scripture, but I can imagine the day that the ark and the door was closed. Can you imagine the people that lived around Noah? Wait a minute, wait a minute, take us with you, especially when the water started to come up on the face of the earth, and all of a sudden people were swimming for their very lives. I can imagine they were probably banging on the door, let us in, let us in. But you know, the truth is, God gives every man woman, boy, girl, an opportunity to be saved his way. And once that way is taken away, there'll be no chance to be saved after that. I'm telling you this because the story of Noah's Ark is much deeper in theology than what we really understand at times. Folks see it as a nice children's story, but there's more to it. If you want to be reassured in a crisis, I suggest you get on your knees and ask God to give you strength and encouragement and courage to get through. As Christians, we have that ability. The lost world doesn't have that ability. They can't get on their knees before God and say, Lord, would you help me with this? Would you help me with that? God doesn't respond to the prayers of an unsaved person. 
The only prayer he will respond to of an unsaved person is somebody crying out for salvation. And we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. God then gives no further instructions about how to build the ark and what to take on and all those things. And you can read that for yourself in Genesis chapter 6. But when we come to Genesis chapter 7, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I want to get to some points that we have and what we can learn from. But first thing I want you to know, when God brings a trial or a crisis to his children, he always plans, uh, his plans are always for our best interest. In other words, anything that God does to us, for us, uh, with us, it's always to make us better. It's never to hurt us. It's never to, you know, we don't serve a God who sits on the throne of grace and says, you know what, I can see so-and-so down there on earth, and he's, you know, he's sort of uh, hasn't had any crisis come his way lately, so I'm going to send this one to him so I can see and watch him squirm. No, that's not the God we serve. God's plans for us are always for our best. He's always in control. Now, I know that sounds a bit cliche, but it's the truth. God brought this event to Noah. He brought it to Noah's attention, and Noah didn't know it was coming. I said that a minute ago. He wasn't aware of this before it happened. God didn't say to him in a few weeks, I'm going to bring you something that's going to be really big, uh, really incredible in your life so that you can't even fathom how big this is going to be. He didn't do that, but God brought the thing to to Noah nonetheless. You know, God doesn't need our permission to do anything. He can do whatever he chooses. God is sovereign. The doctrine of sovereign, the sovereignty of God is all throughout the scriptures. And it just simply means he does whatever he wants, whenever he wants, to whoever he wants. Doesn't need our permission. And what God told Noah is that he had found grace in verse number eight of chapter six. We saw that, but the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's a great, a great promise from God. But in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 4, uh, the crisis is going to sort of ramp up here a little bit where the Bible says, For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. But there's a few details in the middle from where we started in chapter 6 to where we are here now in chapter 7. Uh, Noah was 500 years old when he began and got this message from God to build the ark. A hundred years pass. He's building this ark for 100 years. And when he reaches the ripe old age of 600, God comes to him in verse 4 of chapter 7, and he tells him, you got one week to get the animals in, to get your family in, to do the rest of the things that you need to do, because in seven days, a week from today, so it would be like me saying today, a week from this Sunday, everything is going to be finished You better have your family in that boat. I'm going to shut the door, and the water's going to come. God wasn't messing around. When God said he was going to do something, especially like this, uh, God always keeps his promises. We'll say about that in a a little bit more about that in a minute. Based on what we've experienced this far, if we were honest this morning, this recent virus pales in comparison uh, the turmoil that it has caused, uh, you know, who'd have thought that we as Americans would be going through some of the things that we're going through? But when we compare the things that we're going through to Noah's day, it really doesn't compare. What would you have thought if you were in Noah's place when God came to you a hundred years before and said, I need you to build me this boat? You're going to put your family in it. The ark is going to protect you from the floods that I'm going to send. I'm going to wipe out every living creature from off the face of the earth but you'll be safe and secure. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would have probably been scratching my head a little bit thinking, wow, what in the world? But you know, the truth is the God of the universe can deliver a message like that. Everyone outside of Noah's immediate family and their spouses was going to die. And they were going to be judged by a holy God. And they were going to go out into eternity forever and ever eternally separated from God, never having a second chance at life, contrary to what some of these false theologies will try to teach you, that you're not coming back as a tree or a dog or a cow or a horse or any other thing. When you die in this life as a human being, you're going to meet God. You're going to stand before him in judgment. There's no other way. The Bible is clear about this. There's none other name given among men 
that whereby men must be saved. You know, I'm, I'm probably butchering that verse, but that's the paraphrase of it. But these folks in Noah's day were going to go out into eternity, eternally separated from God forever. Now, please don't misunderstand. The coronavirus is a real virus, and I understand that only God knows how it will end, how many folks are going to die. God knows about all of those things. Matter of fact, he knows if one of us will be there as well. But we can trust God because he's faithful. You know, people are dying from this virus. There's no doubt about that. Families are losing loved ones. They're losing moms. They're losing dads, brothers, and sisters. But can I tell you, there's a verse in the Bible that kind of pops into my mind at this point in time. When things like this happen, sometimes we've got to remind ourselves of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, where the Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. We cannot in our human frailty know everything. But God says here that we can know this one thing. He says this, you can know that everything that happens to you in this life happens for good. By the way, that's a promise. That verse is a promise to Christians. It does not apply to somebody who rejects God, who doesn't want anything to do with God, who thumbs their nose at God, who says, no, God, I don't want to be in church. I don't want to hear the Bible. I don't want to pray. I don't want to be around Christian people, those Bible-thumping people. I don't want to be around them. Romans 8, 28 does not apply to you. Why? Because the Bible says, to them that love God. And by the way, if you love God, you're going to do what God says to do. And it says, to them who are called according to his purpose. That is a clear promise from God to his children that you need to understand uh, this. Everything that happens to us to include the coronavirus happens for our good. Uh, I don't know what it will be, but God will bring good out of this virus for us Christians. Hey, if nothing else, he's slowed us down a little bit. Uh, you know, we live hectic lives. We're kind of constantly coming and going. Hey, many folks have been slowed right down by this thing. Maybe that's what God's trying to accomplish. Maybe he's trying to get us to slow down and think for a second about who he is and who we are. This verse is God's promise to Christians that God has our best interest at heart. No matter what the circumstances, uh, God can be trusted. Back to our text, Genesis chapter 7, verse number 6. The Bible says Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. So God comes to Noah. He said, seven days, I'm sending the water. That is at the time when Noah is 600 years old. And then the Bible says in verse 7, Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his wife's sons uh, with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And then the Bible says God shut the door. When God shut the door, the door was shut. It was not going to be opened again until God would give Moses later permission to open the door later in our story in Genesis. You can read that later on. But I'm telling you, God... Uh, would open the door. Noah and his family would walk out on dry ground. They would be saved from the flood and they would have the responsibility of replenishing the earth. In verse number 10 of chapter 7, the Bible says it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth in the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month. That's around May 7th by, uh, by account. Uh, the, the, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. You know, most folks don't realize this, but Noah's ark was a very important symbol. Uh, you might say it was a shadow of future blessings uh, that would come a few thousand years later. Uh, and the ark was a symbol. In Bible terminology, we call that a type. Uh, so the, the ark was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ who would come later in history. And we know the story in the New Testament about how he was born and all those things. But the ark was a picture of Jesus Christ. Noah and his family entering into the ark is the same thing as you and I trusting Christ as our Savior, entering into the, to the life that, that Christ gives us, entering by faith into the Lord Jesus Christ. We are safe and secure in the Savior's arms when we do that that was the picture of what noah was doing he was entering into the safety that god was providing in the ark god's judgment was on the entire earth no one was exempt and no one his family found grace in the sight of god you know god's grace is available to every person that's ever born 
God has never left anyone out on purpose. As a matter of fact, God's intention was for all mankind to be saved. He said as much in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, where he said, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, where not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's a very familiar verse. Most Christians know it. They've heard it before. But the verse after it also tells us a story where it says this. Second Peter, or First Peter chapter 2, verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. We've heard the stories before of how the Lord is going to come back, okay? He's going to make a couple of trips back, as a matter of fact. The first time he comes, he's not going to step down on the earth with his feet. He's going to be in the air. And those of us who are Christians are going to rise and meet him in the air. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not only that, but those that have died in Christ, those Christian people who have trusted Christ as their Savior, uh, their bodies are in the graves today. But I'm telling you this, their body will be reunited and we will meet them in the air and we will go together with the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving our glorified bodies uh, to live eternally with him uh, in his presence forever and ever. And, and so... Second Peter, or excuse me, First Peter chapter 2 says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. That's talking about the second time that the Lord comes. Christians will see the Lord in the air. No other person that's on earth at the rapture, which is when the Lord comes the first time to take his children away, nobody but Christians will see the Lord. Man will be about their business on earth. Nobody will see him, but we Christians will because what the Bible says is we'll hear the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall be raised first. And we which remain and alive will meet them in the air and so shall we ever be. But when the Lord returns in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, As a thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. But what I want you to know, if you're still on earth at that time, your opportunity for salvation has been missed. All that you have to look forward to at this time, if you're alive then, is God's judgment. And you will not survive God's judgment. Your soul lives on forever. And for us Christians, we'll be living forever with the Lord. But those that are remaining on earth that do not know the Lord as their Savior, they will spend their eternity in a place the Bible calls the lake of fire. Hell is a real place. The lake of fire is a real place. And anybody who, anyone who does not trust Christ as their Savior will spend all eternity there when they die. That's what the Bible teaches. It's not me saying that. I'm not making this up in my own mind. This is what God's Word says. If you're here on earth when the Lord returns at His second coming, you've missed your opportunity by about seven years. You'll go out into eternity separated from God forever. The Bible is clear about this. Not many things are sure in this world, but I'll tell you this morning, that's a sure thing. People tell me all the time, well, do you really believe that a holy and loving God is going to treat mankind that way? Uh, do you think that a holy and loving God is going to condemn mankind for their failures and their mistakes and all the things that the world calls them these days? The Lord isn't condemning them. He's provided an opportunity for them to be saved. It would be one thing. The only way we could call the Lord guilty of condemning mankind for their mistakes is if he didn't provide a way to escape. But he has provided a way. He's provided a way for everyone to be with him for all eternity. But you have to choose it by faith. You have to make a conscious decision to choose Christ. And the sad truth is most people are unwilling to do that. Why? Because they think, hey, you know what? I'm Mr. Big Shot. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. I've got two cars in the yard. I've got kids that are healthy. We play sports. We do this. We do that. And all the things that I need, I have. I don't need God. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning, there's going to come a day you're going to need God. And it'll be too late at that point to choose him. Jesus Christ is coming for his children. Those who have trusted him by faith, those that have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, will go with him like I just explained a minute ago. Let me remind you, according to God's holy word, the Bible says this, that if you simply call yourself a Christian, that does not make you a Christian. I was born uh, in 1962, and uh, I wasn't born as a Christian. I was just simply born into my mom and dad's family, and I didn't become a Christian until I hit age 30. 
And at age 30, I realized that I was lost and undone without Christ. I was a sinner, and I needed a Savior. And I realized it because a good friend of mine told me that I needed it. And at first, I mocked him, and I didn't really pay a lot of attention. But, the, but God began to work on my heart, and he began to draw me to himself. And after a long period of time, I trusted him as Savior. And now here I stand preaching the word of God to, to folks, and I understand that seems like it's a, a contradiction in many respects, but I'm just telling you that's what God did in my life. It wasn't because of me. It was just simply because I was obedient and did what God asked me to do. You can't become a Christian by simply calling yourself one, no more than you can become a car if you hang out in the garage all the time. Christians are born again. they are people who have trusted Christ by faith, they put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're saying to us and saying to the world, I'm not ashamed. I am who I am, and I am a child of God. I don't have to worry about anything anymore because God has my back, and he'll take me through whatever crisis comes my way. You know, Noah's was a real crisis. And when he was summoned by God to be a man who would protect his family, Noah stood in the gap for them. Noah protected his family by obeying a holy God. He protected them. He obeyed God, even when most men would have cut and run. Today's uh, 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 effeminate men that we have around society, too many places these days, and many are in even positions of authority, uh, they would have panicked and they would have run like a little schoolgirl. But Noah stood his ground. Noah stood in the gap and he protected his family. And, and that's a, a lesson to every one of us that we need to do the same Noah trusted God at his word. And, you know, we can go through the next few weeks. We need to remind ourselves of this, of what's truly important. What's truly important is that we're a child of God and that we're trusting God to bring us through this. He's going to protect us and keep us safe. And even if he doesn't, we'll be in eternity with him forever as Christians. What a, what a blessing. You know, we Americans have been spoiled to a great extent never having to really face a real life and death crisis for the most part. Most people living today in America, unless they've gone through one of the wars and have been in a combat situation, and I understand that's true, but most Americans have never experienced anything that's been really uncomfortable for a long period. We're, we're spoiled. We take things for granted. We found out very, clear, uh, very clearly here in the last few weeks, hey, we can't take anything for granted because just last week, or just, I should say, last month, uh, we weren't wondering where we were going to get groceries. We weren't wondering where we were going to get a roll of toilet paper. We had everything we wanted. But God is sending us a message, I believe. We're going through a crisis, but I'll tell you this, with God on your side, it's far better. We don't have to go through any crisis by ourselves. We can have a holy God ushering us through. None of us knows what tomorrow will bring, but the most important things that a person can do is trust God. Simply trust God at his word. He has things well in hand. And, and I'll just say this to you. If you've never trusted Christ, you can today. You can pray a prayer like this. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need a savior and I'm asking you to save me today. I'm sorry for my past life. I'm sorry for rejecting you. I'm sorry for all the things that I've done, but I want you to be my Lord and savior today. And here's the best part. The Bible says, Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord, the Bible says, shall be saved. But you have to understand, you're calling on the Lord to be your Savior and Lord, which means what? You're going to let him have control of your life as you go forward. Your life won't be perfect. You won't not, uh, you won't, uh, you'll still make mistakes. But you have a Father, a Heavenly Father, that will guide you through. Let me say something to fathers, especially young fathers this morning. Noah led his family in righteousness by obeying God. This is God's plan, by the way, for every father. If you're a father of a young family and you have young children in your home and you and your wife are trying to do the best thing that you can to raise them, let me say this to you. The best thing you can do is get them into a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church where they can learn the Word of God. God's Word will teach you as a young father what your responsibilities are, spiritually speaking, for your family. Why is our world so messed up today with so many things? Because people, for the most part, have ignored God. They've ignored his word, and they're just going about to establish their own righteousness when God has set forth what he expects from us. And, and sadly, most people just simply pass it off. 
If you're a single mom, God understands your, your situation as well. God will provide and meet your needs if you'll trust him. You can raise your kids right knowing God's got your back and God will tell you exactly how to raise kids. Don't turn the raising of your kids over to the school system. Public schools today are going to unfortunately ruin kids. And I know that's not a popular thing to hear, but it's the truth. They're not teaching kids anymore. They're conditioning them how to think. And most often it's not the right things. Never mind trying to provide material things that are temporal. Why not give your family a gift for eternity. Give them a godly dad, a godly mom who can lead them to Christ. I know that there's a lot of good folks who work in a lot of these places that teach children today. There's a lot of good Christian ladies who teach uh, children today, and we're thankful for those ladies. But can I tell you, Christian teachers are few and far between. We have to trust God as God would have it. He tells us that over and over, and Noah was a man who trusted him. Christians are not better than anyone. As I stand here this morning, I'm just simply a sinner saved by grace like most other folks that are saved, uh, like, well, like all other folks that are saved. But the truth of the matter is God has your back, and you need to understand that when you are trusting God with your life, he will lead you and guide you through. We're not better than anyone as a Christian, but we are better off. Why? Because we have God on our side. Going through this crisis that we're currently in with God on our side will help us to see things and keep things in perspective. I hope this message has challenged you. I trust that uh, it will help and encourage you to understand that this isn't the end of the world, as some uh, false teachers on the Internet would tell you. Uh, no, this isn't. God has this well in hand. Uh, it's not the plagues of the revelation or any of those kinds of things. God is basically just trying to, I believe, send us a wake-up call. And uh, what we do with his call will be dependent. Some folks are going to leave the phone on the hook. They're not going to answer. Some folks are going to pick it up, and I trust that will be you this morning. Those are my thoughts. I want to challenge you with that this morning. We're going to close in a word of prayer. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you again Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Father, thank you for our time this morning. We ask your blessing on your word as it's gone forth. Help us, Lord, to realize that you are in control and that without you we can do nothing. We'll thank you and praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen.